Yeah, so I would um, like to present, as Professor von Bogdandi just mentioned, on the recent events in, in Ukraine. Initially, I had planned to present my habilitation thesis with the German title Völkerrechtsordnung und Völkerrechtsbruch to you today, published in November. But um, I considered mandatory to postpone these more general reflections and to discuss the current war against Ukraine. So we have all been shocked by the ongoing aggression. And yeah, obviously, this will give us lots of um, topics to talk about in the upcoming months, as so many different legal questions are concerned here. For example, relating to the use of force, to international humanitarian law, to human rights law, the role of diverse international courts and international institutions dealing with this conflict currently and of course this all has also very far-reaching policy implications in regards to um, the european and german foreign policy so and i'm sure we will hear about this also in the next weeks now in view of these manifold questions i will um, focus myself on the use of force questions which are complicated enough and will also deal with the international reactions to some extent this is the, um, the structure of my talk. I will first present a timeline and recall some of the major events of the recent years that are in a way um, uh, yeah, kind of important to understanding the current escalation. I will then mention treaties, instruments and resolutions that are crucial for the legal assessment of the current conflict. And I will then zoom in on three phases of the conflict, which, which firstly is the Russian troop buildup since fall 2021. Then I will talk about the Russian recognition of the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. And thirdly, the Russian aggression against Ukraine will be addressed. And I will then give an overview on the international reactions, and I will conclude with a short outlook. So let us start with recalling some of the major events of recent years. First of all, of course, we have the Russian use of force in Crimea in 2014 and the subsequent annexation. As you will remember, Russian forces entered Crimea, hereby enabled the referendum in Crimea, and then the subsequent um, incorporation of Crimea into the Russian Federation, a clear violation of international law because force was used in, by Russia in order to gain control over Crimea. In April 2014, we saw the declarations of independence by the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. And since 2014, Russia has allegedly supported the separatists in eastern Ukraine, even though Russia has continuously denied to be directly involved here. Another important aspect to mention is the, um, are the Minsk agreements. On February the 12th in 2015, the Minsk II agreement was concluded. The Minsk peace process aimed to pacify the civil war situation in eastern Ukraine. The Minsk II uh, document contained an agreement on the sea, on a ceasefire, on the withdrawal of heavy weapons from the front lines, a release of prisoners of war, and the granting of humanitarian access. Ukraine was further support uh, as opposed to arrange for constitutional reform with the aim that Donetsk and Luhansk regions would receive a special status within Ukraine. This process, however, failed a special start, um, failed because there was no agreement on which steps of the agreement of the agreement should be realized first. And so this all resulted in a sort of stalemate. After 2015, we have a continuing conflict in Ukraine, between Ukraine and the separatist regions. Since fall 2021, we then saw an immense buildup of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border, and there was for a long time a significant uncertainty what this was all about. Um, yeah, on December uh, 17 in 2021, this is also maybe an important aspect to be mentioned here, Russia uh, proposed a draft treaty um, entitled Agreement on Measures to Ensure the Security of the Russian Federation and Member States of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, this was a draft treaty that, um, yeah, in which Russia essentially proposed to, or that was the, the political connotation of it, to withdraw the troops if th this treaty would be concluded with a NATO member states. Main aspects here were the legal commitment by NATO states to refrain from further NATO enlargement, the commitment of NATO states to limit the deployment of NATO to the numbers uh, found in, in 1997, 
and the commitment not to conduct military exercises in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and South Caucasus. Now, this proposal was unsurprisingly rejected by Western states, and then the situation in a way escalated. There was a further troop buildup in January and February 2022, and ultimately on 21st February, uh, Russia recognized the um, LPR and DPR as independent states, and then um, furthermore, a signing of treaties of mutual assistance with these duly recognized states, and ultimately on 24th of February, we have the invasion by Russia in Ukraine. So this is just as a brief um, um, kind of overview on what's, what has happened. The invasion is, as you all know, currently, as you know, is currently going on. Ukraine is being invaded from three different directions, from the Russian territory in the east, from Crime, the Crimean Peninsula, Peninsula in the south, and from Belarus in the north. And I would now like to uh, start with giving you a legal assessment of what is going on in Ukraine. Now, first of all, I would like to recall some of the relevant legal provisions, some of the treaties and instruments that are um, important here. First of all, to be mentioned here is the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. It is itself not a treaty, but it contains a political commitment by the US, by Russia, and by the UK uh, to refrain from the threat or use of force against Ukraine's territorial integrity. The background is that Ukraine gave up its share of the Soviet nuclear weapons and, in response, received political assurances inter alia also in regard to the protection of its territorial sovereignty. The second um, treaty or um, instrument to be a treaty to be mentioned here is the Treaty on Friendship, Cooperation and Partnership between Ukraine and the Russian Federation of 1997, in which both states declared to respect each other's territorial integrity and reaffirm the inviolability of the borders existing between them. And of course, most importantly, the UN Charter Article, Article 2, Paragraph 4 contains a general prohibition of the use of force in international relations. Lastly, I would also like to briefly mention here the General Assembly definition of aggression, a General Assembly re resolution, which is seen to reflect customary international law. Aggression is defined here in Article 2 as the first use of armed force by a state in contravention of the Charter, which is prima facie evidence of an act of aggression. And then we have in Article 3 specific acts, spe specific typical acts of aggression spelled out. I have mentioned some of them here that might be relevant for the legal assessment here. And these are the, um, uh, the invasion or attack by armed forces, bombardment, the blockade of ports, the attack on armed forces of another state, and also um, allowing one's territory to be used for aggressive acts by another state. Now, this list is not exhaustive, but um, others are possible as well. But this is, I think, the, these are the most relevant constellations. So I would, with this legal background in mind, I would like to start um, assessing the uh, situation in Ukraine. The first phase I would briefly like to mention only is the troops build up that we saw since fall 2021. Now it was controversial whether and if so at which point the Russian troop buildup amounted to a threat of force. The prohibition of the threat of force contained in Article 2, Paragraph 4 is a somewhat difficult rule because it is often neglected. I may remind you, for example, of the threats articulated by Do Donald Trump against North Korea, or we may think of military exercises at the border of other states, which states often perceive to be um, threatening. In other words, threats are unfortunately not so unusual in international relations. In regard to the current conflict, there was for quite some time a significant confusion on uh, yeah, Russia's strategies, on Russia's plans, because on the one hand, they, draw, they, they had drawn together these 100,000 soldiers. On the other hand, they declared publicly not to have any aggressive intent. Um, so. Strong arguments spoke in, in favor of here being a, an illegal threat of force. Anna Peters has written on this issue in the FAZ Einspruch journal. And I think uh, we can, yeah, so it's possible to read more about this here. Uh, in any case, I think this is not the most important point anymore because we are now already at a point where the aggression has actually taken place. So let's move to the um, more 
kind of difficult um, and to the aspect with more far reaching implications. Um, the second phase, this is the Russian recognition of the DPR and LPR. Now this recognition was declared on the 21st of February and it remained still unclear initially which effects Russia would draw from um, this recognition or what, how it would set this, uh, this recognition into practice. In his speech of um, the, uh, February 21st, Putin essentially presented here a historical narrative according to which Ukraine had no historical right to be an independent state and was established, he said that uh, Ukraine was established by, uh, by Lenin essentially as a sort of historical coincidence and um, essentially also a mistake. Ukraine was treated as an independent state, um, but in actual fact, so says Putin, it was part of the Soviet Union and had no sovereign rights. Putin, for example, said in his speech here, I quote, in reality, the Union republics did not have any sovereign rights at all. He says further, Ukraine actually never had stable traditions of real statehood. Um, and then an interesting sarcastic com comment also to be found here. Um, he says, you want decommunization? Very well, this suits us just fine, but why stop halfway? We are ready to show what real decommunization would mean for Ukraine. And of course, in Putin's view, this would mean the end of Ukrainian sovereignty. Now, Putin presents a picture of Ukraine as a state that has distanced itself from Russia, a state which is, quote, um, here, uh, aggressive, uh, uh, is, um, of aggressive Russophobia and neo-Nazism, end of quote, and um, a state that is essentially um, uh, ruled by extremist forces and where networks of NGOs are being uh, used also to promote foreign interests. Now, he sees an undemocratic state rules ruled by oligarchs, and this then in his uh, narrative culminates in 2014 with the Maidan protests and the ousting of the Yanukovych government. Now, an important element in Putin's narrative is the allegation of genocide happening in Ukraine. Putin speaks here of, I quote, here yeah, it's also on the slide, horror and genocide, which almost 4 million people are facing because these people did not agree with the West supported uh, coup in Ukraine in 2014 and opposed the transition towards the Neanderthal and aggressive nationalism and neo-Nazism. Now, um, from this, Putin draws the legal actions already described. He recognizes Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states. So the legal background of this has been summarized thoroughly in uh, the recent or in the last week in many debates, also in international law for us. So, but I would just like briefly like to summarize the main points. First of all, the recognition as such it does not necessarily, of course, um, imply the use of force. This is then a second step. And for some time, for three days, there was hope that um, Putin would content himself with just recognizing those two entities as independent states. The act of recognition, nevertheless, is in any case um, a classical form of an unlawful intervention in international law. It constitutes an interference in internal affairs. and. Um, because it also unfolds a coercive potential. So we had this debate, for example, also in regard to the recognition of Kosovo in 2008. In other words, in any case, if a state recognizes the secession of parts of a state, um, this will usually violate the kind of the old state's sovereignty. Exceptions are, of course, possible when the people living in the seceding entity has a right to form an independent state. And this, in this case, the recognition would then, of course, not be unlawful because there is a right to statehood. Such a right to self-determination can potentially be derived from the right to self-determination as contained in Article 1, Paragraph 4, uh, sorry, Article 1, Paragraph 2 of the UN Charter. This right to self-determination, however, does usually only amount to a right to internal self-determination. That means, for example, to measures protecting certain minorities or to a certain autonomy status within the existing state. External self-determination, that means the right to an independent state, may only um, occur under very limited circumstances. A recognized case is colonial oppression. That means a people under colonial rule um, has usually such a right to an independent state. Um, and now the controversial case is 
uh, being discussed under the title of remedial secession. The question is whether in cases of severe human rights violations, a people may nevertheless have the right to external self-determination. Now, this central, the central point thus is um, whether such a right to remedial secession um, exists. The debate um, essentially focuses on the friendly relations declaration, but at least this is the kind of a very important legal document in the background here. This resolution of 1970 um, says, and here I will just briefly quote this, nothing in the foregoing paragraphs shall be construed as authorizing or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of a sovereign and independent states conducting themselves in compliance with the principle of equal rights and self determination of peoples as described above. Now, in other words, the principle is that the right to self-determination may not be used to undermine territorial integrity. However, there is the second half of the sentences, um, which is being discussed in this, uh, in this context. And here, the resolution mentions the need of a government representing the whole people belonging to the territory without distinction as to race, greed, or color. And now here the discussion begins. Can we conclude from this that in cases where a government does not represent the entire people, there may be a right to external self-determination, and that means the right to an independent state? This is the legal question that is being discussed. Now, I would say that practice does not support this conclusion um, that such a right of, to external self-determination is not supported by international practice, but it remains controversial. In any case, and I think this is the crucial point here in uh, the case at hand, is that the factual situation, a factual foundation for such a claim is not um, given in the case of Ukraine. The allegations of genocide that Putin has brought up numerous times are not supported by any source, and even Russia has not given any substantiation to this. So the claim to genocide is rather a propagandistic tool here to um, justify the invasion. So I conclude by saying that remedial secession is not an established principle and its conditions um, are in any case not fulfilled in the current conflict. So the consequence is that uh, Russia has clearly violated um, Ukraine's sovereignty by recognizing um, DPR and the LPR as independent states. And um, maybe just as an additional information, I would like to mention that we already had this debate in 2014 and 2015 here at the Institute. After the annexation of Crimea, Anna Peters, Matthias Hartwig and myself, we published a symposium in the Heidelberg Journal in, of International Law in the ZOAV with the title, The Incorporation of Crimea by, Russian, by the Russian Federation in the Light of International Law. And here we had Russian scholars and also um, Ukrainian scholars, Western scholars um, debating these issues. And here the Russian scholars already presented this argument about remedial secession. And I think it's worthwhile to revisit this symposium, which can be, um, of course, accessed, open access um, uh, in the internet. Now, let us move to the most pressing aspect to the third phase of the conflict, and this is Russia's use of force against Ukraine. Now, the crucial argument here um, in which the legal justification or the crucial document in which uh, Russia presents its legal justification is set out in a speech that is um, a speech of the of 24 February 2022. And this speech has already been now also circulated as a Security Council document. So this is the official justification um, of Russia. Putin here, first of all, presents a historical narrative and highlights the tensions between Russia and NATO of recent decades. He portrays NATO as, uh, this is also here on the, on the slide uh, as a quotation, talking down from the height of their exceptionalism, infallibility, and all permissiveness. He speaks of the turn of Iraq, Libya, and Syria, thus highlighting cases in which Western states have violated international law or in which at least such violations are being discussed. He portrays Russia as a country that is nevertheless still open to cooperation. And he mentions, for example, the proposal of a draft treaty that I have initially also um, mentioned to you. Putin further uh, mentions the following. He says, in adjacent te uh, in territories adjacent to Russia, which I have to note is our historical land, a hostile anti-Russia is taking shape. In his speech again, we find the allegations of genocide uh, being committed by Ukraine. 
And lastly, this is then the, the last part of this, of this slide. Um, we see the announcement of the use of force against Ukraine and the respective legal justification, which I would like to read out to you here. Putin says, in this context, in accordance with Article 51, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, with permission of Russia's Federation, Federation Council and an execution of the treaties of friendship of, and mutual assistance with Donetsk and the People's Republics um, and the Lugansk People's Republic, ratified by the Federal Assembly on February 22, I made a decision to carry out a special military operation. The purpose of this operation is to protect people who, for eight years now, have been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kiev regime. To this end, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, as well as, being, as bring to trial those who perpetrated numerous bloody crimes against civilians, including against citizens of the Russian Federation. So this is the core of the legal argument. Now, analyzing this statement, we find essentially two dimensions of self-defense. The first one is a collective self-defense argument in support of the newly recognized DPR and LPR. Now, this legal justification, obviously, in light of what I have said before, fails on all levels, as both entities are not states. They have no right to self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. And furthermore, it is hard to see which sort of armed attack could be taking place here. So collective self-defense is not possible. Underneath this collective self-defense argument, we nevertheless find um, also, yeah, less, a less explicit reference to a claim that is a sort of a preemptive self-defense argument. Russia conveys the message that it is actually defending against a threat posed by NATO. Now, please take a look at some of the quotations here on this slide. Putin speaks of the Ukrainian military strategy as, I quote, nothing other than preparation of, for hostilities against our country, Russia. He says that Ukraine joining NATO is a direct threat to Russia's security. NATO's troops bordering Russia are, so Putin says, a totally unacceptable threat to Russia. And lastly, Putin declares that, the, that there is the last quotation here on the slide, that a showdown between Russia and these forces cannot be avoided. Now we see here that the idea of preempting a conflict that is anyhow going to occur in the view of Putin is the underlying essence of the justification. Now claims for preemptive self-defense have been made on many occasions in the last decades, but they have always been clearly rejected by the majority of states. So um, I would not even want to discuss whether NATO presence could be seen as a threat. In any case, there is no right to self-defense against threats, but only a right to self-defense against armed attacks. Now, summarizing the legal arguments, we can say that the self-defense argument is the legal core here. Also, it is um, circulated, as I have already mentioned, as the, just, uh, as the letter in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter. So this is um, what the, um, the, the legal claim is about. Humanitarian arguments do play a role here, but they are not a self-standing justification, but rather humanitarian arguments are interwoven with the doctrine of remedial secession as a sort of precondition for exercising the right to self-defense. Yeah, so let me just briefly mention one more point in this regard. Putin refers on many occasions to prior Western violations of international law. I have myself always been very critical about these violations and continue to do so. But in any case, I think it's very clear that th these um, uh, violations, how severe they have been in the past, in no case can be an argument for, um, yeah, for justifying uh, further violations of international law. And so I think this point of the, uh, of the also of Putin's speech is very much beyond, um, uh, kind of beyond the point. It's simply no justification for what is going on, of course. Now I'm almost coming to um, the end. I would now like to have a look at the international reactions that we have had so far. And this is um, a field that gives room for many um, further inquiries and also for many more presentations here in the Referentenbesprechung. Uh, so I would just like briefly like to mention some of them. Now, 
Russia's aggression against Ukraine has clearly been condemned by many states. The um, Security Council is the first institution that, um, yeah, that kind of that is of utmost importance. Of course, there was a draft resolution condemning Russia's aggression, but it was um, vetoed by Russia. And then the Security Council called for an emergency special session of the General Assembly, um, which has then taken the lead here. The UN General Assembly concluded a resolution condemning uh, Russia's aggression, saying that it deplores in the strongest terms the aggression by the Russian Federation against Ukraine in violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter. This resolution was supported by 141 states, five uh, veto uh, voted against it, and 35 abstained, 12 did not participate in the voting. Before the International Court of Justice, we have the ongoing case on allegations of genocide. Hearings are scheduled, scheduled for today and tomorrow. Uh, Ukraine has filed a complaint here against Russia invoking the commission of a genocide on Ukrainian territory as a pretext for its invasion. Now, this case um, is certainly something that we need to discuss um, in further detail in another session of the Referentenbesprechung, also seeing how the hearings today and tomorrow um, uh, turn out. Before the um, International Criminal Court, there are also now preliminary investigations going on. Neither Russia or, nor Ukraine are parties to the Rome Statute, but Ukraine has filed a declaration under Article 12, uh, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute, accepting the court's jurisdiction. And this means that crimes committed from um, 13 November 2013 onwards until today are principally uh, within the uh, court's jurisdiction. This does, however, not apply to the crime of aggression, for which Article 15 bis um, foresees a special regime for jurisdiction. Now, this means, however, that, for example, war crimes or crimes against humanity can be prosecuted and that the court now is, has decided to uh, conduct preliminary investigations, which also covers the current situation. Before the European Courts of Human Rights, we have individual applications concerning Russian military operations on Ukrainian territory. Interim measures have been taken on the 1st of March in 2022, indicating to the government of Russia to refrain from military attacks against civilians and civilian objects. The European Union has issued three packages of sanctions targeting economic relations, um, individuals, also including Putin and Lavrov, and also banks, for example, the partial ban on in regard to the SWIFT system. Many states have condemned Russia's use of force, and in the end, I think we can conclude here that there has rarely been such a strong unity in condemning an act of aggression, um, and this is, I think, something extraordinary. I would like to conclude my presentation with some reflections on possible effects of the current crisis. Will international law be weakened? Are we facing, as the titles of some recent or some planned talks suggest, um, are we witnessing the end of the international rule of law or the end of the prohibition of aggression? In my opinion, there is certainly um, no reason to once more declare the death of Article 2, Paragraph 4, but there, of course, but there are, of course, dangers that we are currently facing. One concrete danger is that Russia has once more suggested a very far-reaching legal justification, and it has shown how arguments about remedial secession can be used and can be put into practice um, in order to provide a legal facade for aggression. Now, I think I have shown in my presentation that this clearly does not reflect the state of the law, but in the decentralized system of international law, it is very much possible that the abuse of the doctrine of remedial secession might also be interesting for other states. So I think this is one danger. My second point that I would like to make here is that um, it is an interesting phenomenon that Russia still invokes international law. Russia remains interested in providing a legal justification, even though this justification is in fact only a propagandistic and I would say essentially cynical invocation of the law. It certainly does not strengthen the law that Russia is relying on it, but rather Russia demonstrates its utmost disrespect. And in, this is of course very relevant um, that a powerful state like Russia essentially is opting out of the system of law, at least for the current moment. And this may of course have negative repercussions for the international system in general. 
What can happen, however, is that all other states reaffirm the law by uniting against the Russian aggression. And we, I think we see strong evidence of this. I think that 141 states uniting in the General Assembly is a strong signal, but it also remains to be seen how states will position themselves um, in the wider course. Now, China and India, for example, have not condemned the Russian aggression and many African states have neither. So I don't believe here that these um, states assume the lawfulness of the Russian intervention, but it shows the geopolitical dimensions of it and that, of this, and that the realignment that is also taking place right now, also with the rise of China, um, has also effects here. And this might be a danger that we um, need to take care of, that, that we need to continue to observe. And with this, I would like to. Um, to conclude my presentation, I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to our discussion.